Well, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome to today's machine learning meetup. We're very happy to have all of you join us today and uh, we hope you enjoy the meetup. Uh, we have Luca today. He is from Elastic. I will give him uh, the floor to introduce himself and tell you a little bit more about his background. He will present to us today and um, let's take all of the questions at the end. Um, I think it's easier for the speaker. And a little bit about me. My name is Dalia and I work on the community team in Elastic. Uh, we always look for uh, awesome use cases or new presenters. So if you ever want to present at one of our meetups, please let us know. Um, you can see on the event page of, the, of this meetup how you can get in touch with us. And yeah, that's it for me. Go ahead, Luca. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you to be here. And uh, let me introduce myself. So my name is Luca, as you already know. And I'm a consultant in Elastic. I'm based in Spain and consultant and education. And I'm based in the south of Spain at the moment. I was based in London before. So, and uh, I'm usually work on the part of machine learning and uh, uh, data analysis and data visualization with Vega and all the part related to, uh, to data, basically how to predict data using the data and uh, helping the customer. So to use the machine learning in the right way. Now, what are we going to see today is uh, a new workshop that we have in, um, in Elastic in order to enable the customer to use the machine learning in the correct way. Now, in most of the case, the people, they have the machine learning because they have the license, uh, but they don't use it properly or they use it in a wrong way, by the way, because they don't know how to do with that one. So we created this kind of workshop uh, uh, to give all the possible information, which is the domain that you can use the machine learning, how you can use the machine learning, which kind of data you should consider when you use the machine learning. Now, we will go through some slide here, and uh, then I will give you a demo um, of um, unsupervised machine learning. And if we have time, I will show you also how to create a feature uh, on the supervised machine learning that at the moment is still on experimental. That means it's beta, it's not released uh, for production, but is there and is, uh, is working, not completely, but is working. Now, first of all, uh, let's, uh, let's start uh, with uh, uh, some information, some generical information. Uh, how do we have to consider um, the machine learning system that we have in Elastic? Uh, um, well, in this case, is an extension of the search. Uh, machine learning is completely integrated in Elastic and uh, is completely uh, useful when you use uh, index in Elastic. So basically, uh, in order to use the machine learning that we have, uh, uh, the system pick up the data directly from an index, analyze the data, and set back to an index. So it's totally integrated with the part of Elastic. You don't need an external database. You don't need anything external because all the part of the job is done directly in Elasticsearch, which is the nice part of this one is that um, uh, when you try to scale um, your uh, machine learning system, you don't have to uh, spend so much time about that one because it's scaling elastic. So you can have a cluster with uh, 3, 4, 10, 15 nodes, as many nodes you want, and you just have to dedicate some of those nodes in order to be machine learning node. What that means in technical term, that uh, a part of the cluster will perform the normal job for a, for a search engine, like Elastic does, indexing document or searching for document. And we have some node that are completely dedicated to the analysis for machine learning. If you need one of the node, one more node, because you have a lot of job to do, you have a lot of data that you want to analyze, you just have to uh, set up a new node on the cluster, set as a machine learning node, and the system automatically scale everything. What that means, the scale, a machine learning node does not contain any shard for uh, document, but automatically spread uh, the full amount of job that you are going to do over the node of the machine learning. So the scalable part of the machine learning system that we have in Elastic, it's completely integrated in the logic of the scaling of Elastic. So scale automatically uh, when you had or you delete some node from, uh, uh, from, from the cluster that you have. Now, in this kind of workshop, uh, we are going to talk about a lot of stuff. I'm not going through everything that you will see here because otherwise we take three days. This is usually um, three days training, five hours a day. 
um, include uh, the time that we work in the data from the customer directly. But what we are going to talk here is an introduction of the machine learning in general terms. First, uh, we need to know what is machine learning. We need to know where machine learning is located inside the uh, full context of the artificial intelligence. And then we are going to talk about the elastic machine learning. Uh, um, which is the characteristic to choose elastic machine learning and which characteristic we have in elastic machine learning, what the system can do, what cannot do, and so on. So that's quite important uh, before uh, to um, think to use it. So what we are going to talk is uh, um, all the paradigm of the machine learning, uh, the project consideration that you have to keep in mind when you select uh, a machine learning system in general terms, and then we are going to talk about uh, Elastic itself, how to create a job, what is a single metric job, a multi-metric job a population, node bucketization, that is quite important, uh, how to set up the data feed, uh, all the part of the indices that are created by the system and the orchestration of the system. I don't think we have so much time then to go on the deep concept of the machine learning, but we are going to throw um, a couple of demo so you can see how the system is working uh, in real, so in real time. Now we have different section. We start with the section zero, that is the introduction for the machine learning, and we try to go over the machine learning feature that we have in Elastic. We also, I want to also, uh, if it's possible, if we have time, I also want to talk to you about forecasting and data visualization. Let's see about the time that we have. Now, this kind of um, um, workshop, this kind of training that we have um, is just to enable people. We are not going really in details of everything because every data is different. Every customer uses the data in a different way. Um, uh, also, the, the data itself, uh, they have different shapes. So we have to normalize the data in some particular way in order to use in part of the machine learning. We need to know the data that we have because we need to, uh, to know if we have quantitative data, qualitative data, which kind of field we have inside the elastic um, uh, index in order to uh, understand in a better way which kind of analysis we can perform on a machine learning system. Remember that the machine learning system itself performs any kind of analysis. Uh, in most of the cases, we are going to use for anomaly detection. So you can uh, spot anomalies every in every kind of document, in every kind of uh, data set. Um, depends what that anomaly doesn't mean for you. So um, I will give you some example later, but an anomaly can be or good or bad. So uh, it doesn't mean that something that is anomalous on a, on a series of data is a bad stuff uh, or is a good stuff. It depends on the context, it depends on the domain and so on. Now, let's talk about the machine learning in general term now. This is the section zero, the introduction. Then we're going to talk about uh, how we spot anomaly, the anomaly detection. Uh, what we use in Elastic as unsupervised machine learning. And then we're going to talk a little bit of analytic functionality. Analytic functionality is totally new. So it's still in beta, as I said before, and this one is supervised machine learning. Um, that means we have to give a little bit of data for training, for training the model in order to use the model over the rest of the data that we have in an index. Uh, and then we are going to talk about also some commercial information, the license, how does it work the license and what you get from the license in order to use the machine learning system. Remember that uh, machine learning is not part of the free of use or open source is not open source. It's part of the license, uh, the commercial license. So we need to know um, uh, where we can uh, reach the machine learning when we don't have machine learning functionality. Okay, so let's go ahead on uh, uh, explanation about what is machine learning. Let me clarify this point because uh, even if we work in IT, I have a lot of customers that they basically have no idea about what is machine learning. They think that machine learning can do everything. Well, that's not really true. So machine learning can do a lot of stuff uh, if you uh, direct or redirect uh, the machine learning functionality in a particular context. Now, let me give you some example. Uh, if you work in an e-commerce, for example, it's quite important uh, to use the machine learning system because the machine learning system, what can do is uh, track a profile of the user in order to uh, propose, that's a proposal engine, 
technically is called proposal engine and um, uh, try to understand what the user like what the user like in a particular moment in time for example in winter there are users that they love to buy some particular stuff in summer some other particular stuff uh, the taste of the people is not always the same. So um, a machine learning system applied to an e-commerce system quite be quite useful if you want to create pages and propose a product that convert the user to a potential customer, from a potential customer, sorry, to a real customer. So you have an index of conversion of the user quite huge. Think about this one. Think about um, Amazon, for example. Uh, that they every time that you access to the page of Amazon and you are a registered user, uh, you always see product that you are interested about. You'd never see something completely different from what you bought before. So the system track about you a profile, try to understand what you like, try to understand about uh, where you live as well, because that's quite important also for select some product, and try to propose those kind of product. It does not propose, it doesn't spend time to propose something that you don't really want according to your profile. That's quite important because that's make a conversion rating very, very fast from a potential customer to a real customer. So you just push the need to customer. The same is for Netflix, YouTube, Spotify. When you watch a movie on Netflix or when you just watch the trailer on Netflix, the system records the time that you spend watching the trailer or reading the information about that movie and perform an analysis over the past movie that you saw. And uh, uh, in that case, the system try to understand which kind of uh, uh, movie you like and try to propose that one. If you use Netflix, Netflix, for example, you will see always that these, uh, there is um, a rating about the movie and say this is 90% compatible of what you like, or this is 75% or this is 25% and so on. Immediately give you back a percentage of interest about that particular movie. That's all calculated with, uh, with a machine learning system that pick up the log of the Netflix, uh, try to analyze what you did, how much time you spend over a particular movie and so on, and uh, try to get back with an analysis about your profile. That's quite important because it is always used on those kind of elements here. It's also possible to forecast some particular information you can try to use the machine learning system, for example, for a stock level when you want uh, when you want to buy stock uh, on the stock exchange and so on. That's possible to do. It's a little bit tricky over there because there are a lot of uh, uh, independent variables involved in the system, but that's possible to do. Uh, the same uh, uh, can be used, the machine learning system can be used also for uh, um, visualization, something for uh, recognize the picture. Uh, or recognize images, so this is called uh, computer viewing, uh, computer visualization, and um, um, the machine learning system, if you set up in the right way, uh, can understand uh, your handwriting, for example, or a number, or a cat, or a dog, or whatever you want to, to use it. This is much more used in something that is called deep learning, but basically it's possible to do. Uh, the voice recognition, Siri, Alexa, and so on, it's quite important as well because the system, the machine learning system can analyze your voice. What that means, that every time that you talk in a microphone, your, the microphone translates your voice in, a, in an electrical signal. So that electrical signal can have different intensity that you have. So the machine learning system can understand the different intensity that you have and can associate with an accent, for example, my not British accent when I speak English, the system can understand that I'm speaking English, but with a different accent than the standard native speaker, but understand what I'm talking about. So that's quite important. All these uh, uh, variation that you have in your voice and everything can be analyzed in real time from a machine learning system in order to answer you back immediately. So what what, what I want to mean here is uh, you can do a lot of stuff with the machine learning system. Uh, usually a machine learning is called machine learning, but it does not learn anything. Improve the algorithm through the experience, but it doesn't learn. Uh, it's just apply different mathematical formula to a series of data. It doesn't matter if the data is a signal, it doesn't matter if the data is a log, it doesn't matter if the data is just an image or whatever, just apply a list of uh, uh, formula 
a list of functions, mathematical function over those kind of elements and uh, uh, give you back an answer according to what the function return back on this particular variable. Now, there are a lot of mathematics involved in machine learning. We're not going to see this one because that's implemented in, uh, in the machine learning itself, uh, in the algorithm of the machine learning itself. What is important is to understand which one you have to use for a particular case. And we will see later that in Elastic, we have more or less 34 uh, different function that we can apply to analyze different kinds of data when we spot anomaly or when we spot some particular stuff. Now, where is machine learning classified? So if you think about artificial intelligence, that means a lot and nothing because artificial intelligence is very huge, uh, is a very huge field. Um, machine learning is a part, is a small part of the artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence include a lot of stuff, include robotics and so on. When we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about a part of the artificial intelligence that include as well neural networking and deep learning. Deep learning and neural, neural networking are two uh, subset of the machine learning system. Now, if we are talking about deep learning, in real, we are going to talk about machine learning with neural network. Every kind of machine learning that we are going to use, they have a specific functionality. For example, a deep learning system can be used, as I said before, to recognize images. Uh, a machine learning is much more, a normal machine learning without deep learning is much more used to analyze data, mathematical, numerical data or uh, uh, non-numerical data if we want to perform classification. So in this case, uh, it's, uh, it's possible to do. What is the nice part? More data the system has uh, and more uh, is able to understand uh, the way that your data is going, um, uh, are taking the trend. So your data are always uh, uh, spread uh, in a particular way, so they follow a the trend. Uh, they are placed in the data set in a particular manner and uh, one of the tasks of the machine learning system is to understand uh, those kind of data, to understand where the data are going, which kind of intensity they have the data, if the data are repeating themselves, if there is a pattern of the data, they repeat it themselves and so on. And when the machine learning system spot that there is a pattern, that there is a cycle, that there is something that is repeating, then in that case is able to perform as well a forecast. So it's uh, able to understand when um, a particular data is gonna change or can ch can, uh, which kind of change can have in the future. That's quite important because we will see as well re regression and classification later that they do this kind of job. Now, uh, let's talk about the different paradigms that we have. We have three kinds of machine learning. Exist just three kinds of machine learning. I mean, we don't have in Elastic. Uh, exist in all over the world, the three kind. We have just two in Elastic, over three. Uh, but it's quite important to understand what they do. Now, the first one is supervised machine learning. Supervised machine learning is something that you have to train. It's called, uh, um, um, basically, it's a, it's a training data set that you have to pass over the system. The algorithm is taking those kind of data uh, and uh, uh, immediately create a sort of classification about those two data. Um, what that means, that if I pass you um, a series of data, for example, from zero to five, and I'm going to set, okay, if is uh, an odd number, then it's true, if it's an even number, then it's false, or the reverse, it doesn't matter. The system understand the logic and the pattern that you're going to follow, and all the rest of the data that you're going to send to the machine learning system, the system is able to classify automatically almost 100% correctly. It's never 100%, it's about 90%, but if, if your data training, training data is correct, all the rest of the analysis that the system does, it's almost correct. Now, this is quite good for classification, is always used for classification, for um, uh, regression analysis uh, and uh, uh, type of machine learning like this one, what you have to do is pass over a vector of data that contains a value and a label. That label is the classification that we want to do and that value is how we want to classify the value. 
Supervised machine learning always, always requires that before you start to use it, you have a system, a, a model, um, I mean, uh, a group of data that you can use for training in order to create a model, and the model will be applied automatically to all the rest of the data that will arrive in the future. So you have to train the system, to, you have to teach to the system first what you want, and then let the system work in that way. Uh, unsupervised machine learning, that is the, the, the most used in Elastic as well, uh, we use for different, uh, this is different location, we can use for different domain, and uh, basically it's completely the reverse as before. We don't need to train the system, so we don't need to teach to the system what we want to do. The system tries to understand automatically what he has to do. So uh, how does it work? I'm going to give some data to my system and my system try to spot a pattern. That's what the system try to do in unsupervised machine learning. Try to find a specific logic, a specific pattern over the data that I'm going to insert. So it's a sort of learn by doing. That means uh, more data I have, more data I'm going to feed my system and much more precise is the analysis that unsupervised machine learning can do because more data you have, more easy uh, can be for the system uh, to find uh, a pattern that goes over time. Something that didn't say before, every data that you're going to pass to a machine learning system, it should be the time series data because uh, it's always based on time, the analysis that we are going to do. So it's quite important to have a time series, um, at least in Elastic. So unsupervised machine learning is very used in Elastic because we are going to uh, work uh, a lot with anomaly detection and anomaly detection, uh, the best way to use it, it's unsupervised machine learning. And then we have the third uh, way, the third paradigm of the machine learning system that is called reinforcement learning. That is something a little bit particular. We don't have in Elastic, probably we will never have in the future because uh, it does, it's used for some particular domain that we are not, uh, not involved at the moment. So it's a sort of reward and punishment. Uh, you do an action. If the action is correct, the system gives you a reward. If the action is not correct, uh, the, the, the system gives you a punishment. Everything is based. <clears throat> sorry, everything is based on uh, uh, Markov chain. Markov chain is a mathematical theory, uh, and uh, um, we use the MDP, the Markov de decision process, uh, in order to learn by uh, the signal. Let's say data. They are data, but usually are signal that we receive in input. Um, it's something that tries to balance it between what is already known by the system, the, the current knowledge, uh, what uh, uh, compare to what we don't know. So it's try to map in some particular way what the system doesn't know. Uh, it's try to map to something that already know. If it's not possible to perform this mapping over here, the system will classify the unknown as a new event that arrives. Where we use the reinforcement learning is basically in robotics or in some particular statistic stuff. So that's quite, uh, um, uh, quite very, very strongly used in that, uh, in that particular area. Again, we don't have in, in Elastic, probably we will never have in the future. I don't know, depends how evolved the system, but at the moment, this one is something that's completely how the domain of Elastic. But it's good to know that exists. Now, just to have an overview, the supervised machine learning, what does is most classification, uh, classification algorithm, try to find a function that map a value over another value. So I'm going to pass a vector, that vector contains two value minimum, there's a, okay, can have a lot different, but contain two value minimum. One is the value that I want to classify, the second is how I want to classify. And when the system knows that those kind of information, I can classify any kind of uh, uh, data that I want. Now, it can be a binary classification or can be a different classification. So a binary classification is just a true, false, or zero, one, or uh, black and white, whatever you like, or can have a different kind of classification. So in different kinds of classification, you need a specific function that perform more than a binary classification. But that's possible to do without any issue. 
The unsupervised machine learning, that is the one that we use over here, is one of the most used, by the way, all over the, all over the world huh? when we're talking about machine learning. We can use for clustering, we can use and we use for anomaly detection, neural networking, uh, uh, latent variable, and a lot of different stuff where we don't know the data, but we want to spot out something from the data. Let me open a parenthesis here. Uh, most of the customers, they have a lot of data. They store a lot of data in their own uh, system, but they don't know uh, how to use those kind of data. So uh, what they have is a huge amount of data that they have no idea which kind of information those data can do. And some of those data, they have very interesting information from a business point of view, from a technical point of view, from a knowledge point of view in general. So one of the most uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, part to use the machine learning, in particular the unsupervised machine learning, is when you have a lot of data, you don't know what to do with that data, so you just feed uh, a job on unsupervised machine learning, and the unsupervised machine learning try to spot everything is possible over those kind of data. Give you back a feedback in a form of number and graphical part, and over there you can understand uh, if you can use those kind of data for something that probably never mm, thought before. So it can be completely uh, a new discovery, let's say, of the data that we have. Remember that every company, in most of the case, every company, they, uh, they have 75% of the data that they have no idea how to utilize, apart whatever they are doing. But most of the case, they have a lot of data um, without any without any meaning. So a machine learning system, unsupervised machine learning system can give a meaning to those kind of data. Let's go to reinforcement learning. As you can see here, this is the domain where we can use the reinforcement learning, game theory, control theory, information theory, simulation-based optimization as well. That's very used in uh, uh, when you do uh, something uh, for technology, for example, space uh, discovery or whatever, swarm intelligence, that's very nice. I saw some simulation about the swarm intelligence. Uh, so basically you have a community and the system tries to spot the habit of that community. What is normal, what is not normal in that community. That can be a community of people like a city, for example, or a community of hand or uh, insect in general or whatever it is. And then he's using robotic system um, because uh, uh, it's uh, one of the best way that a robot can learn how to do and in statistical studies in general. So we have a lot of different applications where we can put reinforcement learning. Now, uh, why we work uh, in Elastic uh, in most of the case with unsupervised machine learning and we are going to start uh, now to use the supervised machine learning because that's the job that we are going to do. This is the domain that we are. We are a search engine. Over a search engine, you can find all the kind of information that you want. And for us, the unsupervised machine learning is very important because when we spot an anomaly, we can understand what we have over the data. So that's why we are very, very concentrated in unsupervised machine learning. And we are going to start now with supervised machine learning that probably will be ready for production in version eight. Okay, so now let's go over elastic machine learning. Let's talk about elastic machine learning. So as I said before, we all, um, we try to use for filter and search anomalies to understand the data that we have, to organize the data, to, um, understand if the data, they have a pattern, that's quite important. Uh, to perform some particular analysis that you want to perform, it's up to you. Depends on the job that you're going to use, you can select a particular mathematical function to apply to those kind of data and receive back a feedback that give you back some answer according to what you're looking for. This is quite important concept. Before to use the machine learning system itself, what you should do is to have a question, because if you don't have a question, you have a result from the machine learning system, but you have no idea what kind of question that result can answer. So it's quite important to start with a question and then decide how to set up the job, a machine learning job. When I say job, I say um, an analysis, a machine learning analysis. Uh, you can also create views in Kibana directly with the machine learning system. So everything is applied, everything is connected. So uh, the machine learning system automatically pick up the data over the index. 
index pattern uh, from Kibana, um, uh, perform the analysis, save the data inside another index, and make the index available to you in order to create visualization. So you can also create nice visualization and uh, let people are not involved in machine learning like marketing, sales, or whatever to have a look about uh, those kind of visualization here with all the data that the machine learning can do. Machine learning can also, uh, in Elastic, can also do real time. Every time that new data arrive inside the index, start the analysis and put those kind of analysis uh, um, as a full amount of result of the machine learning. Everything will be saved in, in the proper index. So that's why you should use the Elastic machine learning for spotting anomalies and for understanding what you can get from your data as much as possible. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit how to decide which kind of machine learning system you want to use. Even if you use Elastic, of course, you can use an external machine learning system. That's not a problem, absolutely. So the important is to read, uh, perform a query over Elastic and pick up the data and you can pass to an external system. But when you decide to use a machine learning system, you have to keep in consideration some particular part. Now, unless you are very, very small, you do just for hobby and everything, if you are a big company, you always have to deal with cost, uh, people that they work on this kind of stuff and so on. So you have to be very careful when you select a machine learning system uh, in order to have a, um, a good uh, um, scalability. So you want to scale uh, easily without spending so much time. And here, as I said before at the beginning, we scale automatically because uh, the system belongs to the machine, the, the Elastic logic, and the Elastic automatically scale. Think about this one. If I have my own Python script uh, with uh, Skilllearn or whatever I want to create, a PI Torch or so on, um, I have a script. I can also pass the uh, information to that particular script, but it's my problem then if I have a lot of data to scale those kind of script and can become very, very tricky. I know that you can put on Kubernetes, uh, you can create as many pods you want and so on, but can be very, very tricky. It's a job that you have to care about. When we're talking about Elastic, when we're talking about the scalability of Elastic, you know that the system automatically scales by itself. So you just have to add a node at the cluster and the system can go. And it's quite easy because you just have to configure that a particular node is a machine learning node. You give memory, uh, try to put on a particular server that has a, um, a huge amount of processor because that's what we're going to use a lot, uh, CPU and then the system scale by itself. So it's something that you don't have to care really. Efficiency, how efficient is the analysis performed by the system? Because if you have a machine learning system that is very beautiful to use, but what sent back is not trustable, is not reliable, it's 20% correct, over 90% correct that you need, it's totally useless and it's just a, a a lot of a lot of time that you've asked and sold money and so on. Uh, timeliness, in particular, if you work in security in this case, uh, you need that the system spot something and send you a message, okay? If I spot something as a machine learning system, then I have to find a way to send you a message that something is happening because probably you want to be immediately um, uh, notified if something happened. And uh, uh, what the Elastic Machine Learning does, let it use the, jo the, the watchers. So um, it's also possible to create an automatic watcher with Elastic, uh, with the machine learning job, or you can create as many watchers you want. The watcher goes inside the data analyzed by the machine learning system. Uh, they perform a check every, I don't know, five seconds, three seconds, one minute, depends on your configuration. And then you can spot, uh, they can notify you by mail or they can notify you by another index. So that's quite important to do. It's an integrated system on notify, uh, notify um, uh, the information. With the last version of Elastic as well, you can have notification on Slack, you can have notification wherever you want. So we have different ways to notify uh, user. The accuracy of the, 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 the analysis, that's also important, as I said before. It must be efficient, fast, and accurate as much as possible. 
And then you also have to uh, consider if it's possible to apply to a particular domain. Because, for example, if you want to teach a robot how to walk, it probably is not the best way to use the machine learning system that we have in Elastic because we don't use reinforcement learning. But if you want to spot anomalies of a security file or any other kind of file and you want to spot some particular anomalies, uh, in that case, uh, um, the domain is correct. So basically, uh, that's one of the domain that we're going to use. So it's very important that you focus on the domain that you want to use before to select a machine learning system. It must be adaptable. So um, every time that you change your data and everything, it should be uh, easy at least uh, to recreate a new job, to recreate with new rule and to apply a particular mathematical function to that new uh, data set. Now, as I said before, we have a lot of function that we can apply. It's by default, it's 32, 34. That is a lot, by the way. And uh, it's quite easy that if your data change, if your data set is going to change, it's quite easy to select another, create a new job with uh, selecting a new function that you can apply to this kind of uh, data. Usability as well, so it should not be very difficult to use it. And in this case, you just have to configure some particular stuff and let the system work automatically. And then affordability. Well, in this case, uh, it's up to the budget of your company. Of course, the cost uh, can be a problem. And there are two kinds of costs when you have to think about a machine learning system. The first is the machine learning system itself. For example, in Elastic, you need the license. But if you use something external to Elastic, you still need to buy the system. If you want something trustable or a service that you want to use and so on, you can pay for minute, you can pay for second. Uh, for uh, the CPU usage and everything, so that's a cost. Plus, uh, you have a second additional cost that usually is the data scientist team or the, the people that they can use the machine learning one. So you need to dedicate someone that knows how to configure a machine learning part and uh, um, use it. So answer your question. Now, in this case, uh, um, as part of the uh, Elasticsearch, you already have over there, and if you are an Elasticsearch and engineer certified, for example, or a user or an administrator, you should know how to use the machine learning, or you can learn very easily and a very fast way. So you don't need a dedicated data, data scientist that goes over the system and uh, configure for you. So this is a lot of stuff, uh, but that's something that you have to care before to select a machine learning system. Now, let's go a little bit deep about uh, uh, the, the part of the Elastic. Uh, we are going to talk about anomaly detection, and we're going to talk about analytic functionality. Now, anomaly detection is the most used at the moment. The analytic functionality is still on beta, but the anomaly detection is one that, that lets you spot something uh, uh, strange uh, that is going to happen over your data. Let me give you an example. What is unusual? What's something that is unusual? What is an, an, an anomaly? Uh, it doesn't mean, I want to be very clear here, it doesn't mean good or bad. It depends on the domain where you are. Probably in security, a uh, peak uh, of uh, access means something bad. But in an e-commerce system, a peak of sale means something very good, by the way. Now, what is unusual? Unusual is something that is different from the same type in a way that is surprisingly interesting or attractive. What that means? Let me give an example. If you have a picture with, with 20 guys on the picture, and then there is a dog, probably your eyes immediately goes to the dog because the dog is unusual in that case, okay? So it's something that spot uh, doesn't follow the pattern. Just to say in a mathematical way, it's something that uh, over the full pattern of the data, it does not respect this kind of pattern. It's still inside the pattern, but it does not follow the rule of the pattern. That's basically what is unusual. And that's basically what is an anomaly for us. Now, let me show you something. Let me show you some picture. This is an analysis over um, a data set, an example data set that we have. And as you can see, the line, the blue line is my trend. The uh, blue, clear blue background is called the trending. That's the model, by the way. And we see immediately that there is one of the data that pick up. So it's immediately there is a peak over there. 
and we have a dot over the peak. The system say, hey, listen, this one, it doesn't follow the rule. Every um, other data that we have in the data set, they stay between a range, a minimum and a maximum, but this kind of data is going out of the maximum, can go also out of the minimum, but that's unusual. That's something that the system does not expect. So the system immediately pick up that particular data and try to classify as an anomaly because it's not normal over that specific pattern that we have. Um, that's basically what is unusual. If you think about this blue line, like your distribution of the data that you have, doesn't matter if it's a normal distribution, not normal distribution, skewed distribution, that's completely something that we don't care about that one here. Uh, but you can see immediately on those kind of data that there are some particular uh, stuff that you can notice immediately. First of all, all the data, they stay in a particular range. They can go a little bit out, they can go a little bit down, but they stay in a range. That range is defined by the background, the blue background that we have. And then we also have some missing data. So here there are data that are missing and that's quite important because the system taking consideration as well the missing data that we have. Now, this is a very small set, so it's quite easy to do, but there is a lot of stuff that you can understand in a portion of the graphic like this one. So in this case, probably we can decide to use a particular function in order to analyze this kind of system here. And probably that anomaly over there that you see, the peak that you see with the blue dot, it's not really an anomaly because it's an anomaly in that moment, but not all over the full amount of data that we have. Uh, anal an analyzing the result of the machine learning, you, be, you need to be very, very quiet. Um, quite uh, on uh, supposition or interpretation that you can have. Now, uh, everything that we spot the data like this one, we use unsupervised machine learning because that's the best way to spot a particular peak like that one or data that they go out of the data set uh, uh, between a minimum and a maximum of a range. Now, let's talk about something very particular and then we go with a demo. Um, we talk about something that is called detrending. Some people they call modeling, uh, we call the trending. And as you can see here, we have a trend that is repeating. It's a repeating trend. It starts in a particular manner between a minimum and a maximum. And then what we have is increase for a while, then go down again, then you have a line, then increase again, then stay for a while, then go down and so on. As you can see, we have a real pattern that we have to, uh, we can see immediately here. That's what the machine learning system is able to do. So spot the real pattern. Even if you don't see the pattern, it's not so clear as you can see now in the slide, uh, but the machine learning system is able to spot the pattern. And that's what we want. That's what uh, we want that the system does, spot the pattern. And once that the pattern is defined, the system can spot um, an anomaly. Uh, because it's too high or because it's too less. Now, what the, the trending does is exactly try to understand the pattern of the data. So as you can see at the beginning here, the blue background is a little bit wide. So it incorporate all the blue line, yes, but it's a little bit wide. If you're going to see uh, close to the end, so this is a timeline. So that means the beginning is on the left and the, uh, and the end is on the right. As you can see, the blue background is gonna shrink. It's gonna become a little bit closer to the line. That's to the trend. What that mean in terms of unsupervised machine learning? That at the beginning, we have the initial part of the data, the system doesn't know anything about the data, is going to learn about which kind of pattern we have over here. Then the system spot the pattern, spot some anomaly, as you can see the, um, the vertical line, the orange vertical line say, hey, this is value I never seen before, for me it's an anomaly, and then mark immediately as an anomaly because it's the first time that the system see that stuff, and then go ahead and you see that the pattern go down again, follow again, and the second time that the pattern goes up, you have a blue vertical line. Blue vertical line means, yes, this is an anomaly, but it's not a dangerous anomaly, or it's not a so um, high level anomaly. We don't classify so much. That means uh, I already saw this kind of pattern before. I cannot consider really an anomaly. 
And on the third part, you see that there are nothing over there and the last part as well. So um, after the second cycle that you see over here, you see that the system immediately recognize the pattern and adapt that the trending, the model, um, shrinking and making it very, very close to the blue line. So that's very important. That means the system understood the pattern of this kind of stuff. So it's try to consider this kind of pattern normal. So there are no anomaly in the future. That's something that I say at the beginning. You need a lot of document in order to uh, let the system understand the pattern because just few document, few information, uh, everything will be um, uh, an anomaly here in real, even if it's not an anomaly. So as you can see, the system learn by doing, learn by receiving the data. This is some other example. This is uh, um, a very huge the trending. So we have a model that is very, very wide uh, um, around the blue line. But the second one, the low on the right, uh, um, we have we see that the trending is a little bit better. So the first one, the top on the left, uh, is at the beginning of my data, uh, my data set, and the other one is at the end of my data set. As you can see, learn immediately which kind of pattern the system is going to follow. And that's very important because it means the system is going to work very well. Um, and the same here, we have uh, uh, some particular anomaly that we can see. Now, what the system does when we are going to pick up an anomaly, the system uh, try to classify the anomaly. That's very important because in Elastic, what we are going to do is uh, classifying anomaly, classifying what is unusual. Now, how the system does this kind of job is using, using some particular mathematical formula based on the probability that something happened. Let me explain a little bit clear. Now, my question here can be, my flight ticket can likely increase this week. So I want to know if during this week, my, the flight, the cost of the flight can increase. I'm going to use some particular data flight that we have by default. And we have different anomaly over there. And as you can see, we have some blue, some red. Now, blue means, yes, is an anomaly, but is not so uh, um, anomalous compared with the previous data. And the red means I don't really expect this particular data over here. It's too high, it's too low, but this is quite uh, not, not dangerous, but is quite high anomaly rating. Now, what the system does, as you can see in the pop-up, there is anomaly score 98. That's just a number. It doesn't mean 98%. There are no percentage over here. This is just a number that the system create and say, hey, this is an anomaly of rating 98. And we classify in two ways. We classify with a number and we classify with a color. There is a reason why. It's just for attract your attention because that number doesn't mean anything and the color as well. Just means the probability that that particular data will be in that particular value is so low that I give you a very high score and then I put in red in order to attract your attention, okay? Can be um, a dot, can be a cross. When we have a dot, it's something that goes up and down immediately. When we have a cross, we have something that goes up and continues for a while, affect a second bucket and then come down. So basically that's my anomaly. Which kind of anomaly we have over here? On the price of the ticket, we have that the price, the actual price is $12,000. That is a lot, by the way. When the system expect as a maximum 8,807 and the minimum 1,159. So the system expect in order to be normal, to stay in that range, go a little bit outside that range on the upper bound or lower bound, that's perfectly okay. But this is very, very high. Okay, this is really high because it's a lot high, it's two times higher than the normal. What the system does is quite easy. So pick up one information that is the probability, the last that you see here in the picture, that is 0 0.00002155574, whatever it is. So uh, as you can see, the probability that that anomaly happened, that the price goes to $12,000, it's very, very low. And uh, if the probability is very, very low, 
the severity or the classification of this particular anomaly is very, very high. So that's, uh, uh, that's very important. So I have a 98. I know that that particular value, it's very, very difficult that can happen now in that particular moment. So that's quite important. How the system does is just apply um, a quantile normalization process and pick up and come out with this number. I want to be clear here. Uh, number is not a percentage, again, I want to repeat. It's just a very huge number because we can arrive from zero to 100. We'll we will never touch 100, by the way. So we arrived from zero to 100 and it's just to attract your attention because when you are attracted by the number and by the color red, because the red immediately means something wrong or something strange, uh, you can go over there and uh, take action. I don't know what, whatever you can do, but you can take action. You can say, oh, look, this data is too high. Let me control why we have this data so high and so on. It's really just to attract your attention. What you can do in, in, in Elastic, you can also send a no, notification about that one. So that's how we calculate everything. Let me go directly to a demo because we don't have so much time uh, at the moment. Let me just uh, switch uh, um, one second, Chrome tab. Let me go to the overview. Now you should see my Kibana. I'm going to use the version 7.10. So it's uh, 7.10.2. That is the last version that you can download. And you have here two way to do. So the first one is anomaly detection. And the second one that you will see here with a radio job is an analytic functionality. Now, let me show you how does it work. I want to create a new job. Uh, the system asked me which kind of data pattern I want to use. This is uh, um, Kibana. This is not directly to the index. This is the Kibana data pattern that we have. So we are going to use one of those. I use an example because I have some example over here. Let me use the Kibana sample flight so we stay the same in the slide. And the system asks what you want to do. Now let me explain also this one. Uh, single metric and multimetric, we are going to go, we're going to perform analysis over uh, numerical data, okay? Quantitative data, so numerical data. I can do in one single uh, field or I can do for more than one field. Of course, the implication is different because one field will be analyzed as a single field. Multimetric uh, can be um, in the same job, but different single metric, but they can also interact with each other because we have something that is called influencer. Then we have the population analysis. The population analysis does a, the same identical job, but in a different way. So meanwhile, the single metric, for example, try to spot an anomaly over a particular field. The population try to understand how that field behave all over the data set. So if something goes out of the behavior, normal, be, normal behavior of that specific field, then will be an anomaly. Sometimes it's much faster to use the population. The advance is just a matter that you configure. If you want to select a specific function, then you have, or a specific query or a specific aggregation, you have to uh, go through the advance. And the categorization is just an analysis over uh, text, keyword text. For example, log, you can analyze with categorization. Now, let me go over the data visualization at the moment. So what we have here is, um, let me use the full one. Okay, and let me stop this one. Now, as you can see here, we have all the data inside the index. This is the number of document that is in red. Everything that is a numerical field will be blue. And we have interesting information here. So we have the number of document that we are going to take in consideration, how many distinct value we have in this case. Let me make a little bit bigger. And then we have the minimum value the maximum value at the median value. We don't have the average, we have the median, okay? So we are going to divide, this is a, a distribution. This is the, not a standard distribution, but it's a distribution. And the median perform exactly the uh, middle value. It's a, it's a statistical median. So it means uh, that the area of my distribution will be divided in two 50% part. So the value exactly that divide the area of this distribution is $626.09. Uh, 
So we have, we can also see the top value if we want. So we know how many on the percentage we have of the replies. Um, and we can do for every numerical data that we have. And then we have Boolean data that we can see. For example, in most of the flight, some 13% are cancelled and 86-87% uh, more or less are not cancelled, are performed normally. They can be delayed, but they are normal. And then we have oh, everything that is a string or a keyword. So this is uh, um, another kind of data. And we also have uh, the uh, object, the JSON object that we can track over here. So as you can see, we have the destination country, um, and the destination city name. In the destination country, we have that 18.2% uh, uh, of the flight, they go to Italy, 15.9% uh, they go to US, China, uh, Canada, and so on. And as well, you have the destination city and so on. Those kind of stuff, uh, the name that you see here, destination country, destination location, destination region, they are name of the field of the document that they have in the index that I'm going to be considering for the analysis. So this is a quite very good way to work with uh, uh, the part of the machine learning. I think this feature here is also included in the free usage of uh, um, Elasticsearch, not the analysis, but the visualization, yes, uh, because it's like a discovery, but in a different way. Now, let's go back and let's do something particular. Um, oops, let me pick up again. Sorry, I did back. Let's go to perform, for example, a single metric just to make it easy. We can use the full amount of data that we have. This is how you configure a job, so how to configure an analysis. When you click on use full Kibana sample, the system automatically pick up. It must be a time series, so pick up the older and the new one, so and try to spot between this range over here. Then you go to the next, you select which kind of field you want to perform the analysis. That's quite important. Look at this one. We have different field. When I have the event rate, event rate is not a field. It's just the number of the document that we have. We can count the number of the document. We can perform an out count on a low count and so on. So just put the high number or the low number of document. But then we have the field itself. So for example, the average ticket price, this is one of the field. We have uh, the career, we have the day of the week and so on. And look at this one, the system knows that average ticket price is a number. So it's something that I can perform a mathematical uh, calculation over. I can perform a sum, I can perform a mean. This is not the median, it's the mean, the standard average and so on. But the career, that is the name of the flight company, Airways company, so it's just a distant count. I cannot perform any mathematical calculation. So the system automatically filter for you uh, which kind of operation you can perform on that specific field. Now, let me pick up, uh, for example, uh, has no sense what I'm doing. Eh? Don't, don't, I'm just doing a test because uh, average ticket price is a field that is already a calculated field, is an average. I'm going to do an average of an average that has no sense, but I want to show you just the pattern. Now, this is the pre-configuration. This is the partner that you have. We want to spot anomaly over here. We want to understand if something goes outside of this pattern. Now, what I have to do is bucketization. That's very important. How do I want to analyze those kind of data? Uh, in which way I want to analyze? For example, we have two months over here. I want to split those two months in block of 50 minutes, for example, or one hour or one day or uh, one month, depends which kind of analysis you are going to do. Every time that you select a bucket span, so a time frame where you have to perform the analysis, the system does two stuff. First, get all the analysis of the data that you have all over the time, because that's what spot my pattern that we have. And then it's going to analyze exactly that 15 minute according to the previous analysis. So if I'm going to analyze the first 15 minute and then the second 15 minute, I have half an hour of analysis. I will use the result, the system will use the result of this uh, hour, half an hour of analysis in order to understand the third bucket of 15 minutes, the third block of 15 minutes. And then you can convert in a multimetric, we don't do now. So uh, we go to the next, we have to give a job ID that must be unique. So let's call test uh, um, meetup. 
um, you you can select a group if you want you can group together um, job this is just a label I can call as I want I can call Luca for example I can call um, meetup so it's just a way to classify jobs then uh, I can perform two kinds of stuff over here. I can perform an, um, a custom URL in order to uh, reach uh, this particular visualization and that's all. Because sometimes I have a lot of job, I want just to give someone the right to see one single job, so I have to create a custom URL. And then if we want, we can create a calendar. That's quite important concept. A calendar lets you uh, skip some analysis. Let me give an example. You have an e-commerce. You are going to analyze the data from an e-commerce point of view, and you have the Black Friday. You know that the Black Friday doesn't follow the rule because you will sell a lot than normal. Uh, much more order you will receive than normal. So in that case, you don't want to consider an anomaly every uh, increase of the order because that's happened in a particular occasion. What you can do is you can create a calendar that spot that particular day or two day or whatever it is uh, long your uh, uh, promotion that you have. And the system will automatically ignore every kind of anomaly in that specific particular time uh, frame time. So by default, you don't have any calendar, but you can create as many calendar you want. You cannot create a calendar for time. What I mean, you cannot say, OK, uh, between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock every day. That's not possible to do. But it's possible between one day, a particular time, to hand to another day, a particular time. So it's just uh, between days. And then we have the advanced configuration. So we have the model plot to say the information about the model itself. We can use a dedicated index. If we don't use a dedicated index, the system will write everything in a common index. We have an index that is called .ml uh, anomalies something. And that's the common one. Every job that you have over here, even if they have data that they are not compatible between each other, they will save on that common index that you can use for visualization. But you can also ask to create a dedicated index for this particular job because probably you want to be uh, very carefully when you create your own visualization. So you want an index specific for this job to use in your visualization. So I can do it. Uh, and then you have just to set how many memory. The system tries to guess according to how many data you have, how many memory you need. You can increase, of course, be very careful because you can increase now that you create the job. Later, uh, you have to modify the job and not all the job is possible to modify. For example, in analysis, it's not possible. In an anomalies, yes, but the analysis, no. So you put the memory that you want to use. This is the memory limit. A maximum that I can use is 110 megabyte in order to analyze this one. Be very careful because this is a performance issue, can be. So if you have one node of machine learning, all the job that you have, they will be spread on the same node. If you have three nodes of machine learning, all the job that you configure over here will be spread over the three nodes. So you have to be a little bit careful how you use the memory. Remember, the machine learning uses a lot of processor and a lot of memory when perform analysis. Then we can go ahead. We see that we have a time range. Again, you cannot use data that are not time series. And we have a model memory limit that is the one that we just set up at the moment. So what we are going to do is uh, the system is ready now. What I can do is ask the system to perform an analysis. So if I'm going to create the job, the system start, it takes a little bit of time, analyze the pattern over here and try to spot some anomaly. If you see now, it's going to create, uh, as you can see at the beginning, spot the anomalies. Orange means it's quite important. Blue is not so important. So increasing the color. As you can see now, the anomaly decrease. We don't have so much anomaly now. And then we are going to uh, see that the anomaly will be basically null. So we don't have anomaly at the end. That blue means it's a little bit lower or higher than expected, but not so important. Now, this is my pre-analysis job. The system did. And what we can do is view the result. In order to view the result, 
the system open a new tab and you have the result over here this is the table with the result this is the data that we're going to analyze we have just one because it's a single metric and we are going to see this is the last part of the data look at the, the trending look at the model it's very very close to to my trend so that means my background the azure background will it's very very close that means the pattern is almost uh, harmonical so it's always repeating itself in most of the case we have some anomalies here we have some anomalies over here as well but in most of the case the pattern is repeating itself so if i want to see for example this anomaly 30 that is this one so the system spot immediately so we have high multi-bucket impact means it's starting the first 15 minutes and finish in the second 15 minute actually is $753 because we are going to analyze the price. Upper bound is one, um, 1,180 and lower bound 550. What's happened is inside that range. Look at the strange stuff is inside the range, but it's quite uh, um, low probability that that particular price take the 753 it should be something different than 753 let's see what's happened so if i'm going to open here down as, as you can see we have the probability here and the probability is 0 0.0096 that is not so much but in this case between all the anomalies that we have over here this is the lower probability and that means this is the higher number of uh, uh, anomalies, is the number uh, high rating of anomalies. If I'm going to open this one, in this case, as you can see, we have 0 0.03. So we miss a zero here in the middle. So it's a little bit less and the system classify as a four, okay? Let me analyze a little bit. So we are going to use as a detector for this analysis, we are going to use a, a field called average ticket price. We are going to perform the mean of the average, total nonsense from a mathematical point of view, but let me just use as a test. The actual price is the actual value is 753. When typically expect in that moment, in exactly in that point, the system expect to have 823, not 753. And is 1.1 per lower than expected. That's why it's an anomaly. Again, it doesn't mean that is good, bad, or whatever. So it's just about your interpretation over here. You can move this one to see a particular point. As you can see now, I just move on that particular uh, uh, range. I can increase the range if I want to see a little bit of more data. So I see the pattern a little bit better. I can increase the range as much I want. So basically that's not a problem. And as you can see, the debt trending is gonna get burst here because at the beginning, the system still didn't spot the, um, uh, the pattern of the data, of the distribution of the data. That's basically what we're going to do. Look at this one. If we are going here, and if you are going here, it's quite different than the other. Look at the beginning, really, really at the beginning that we have over here. As you can see, we don't have uh, nothing as a background. That means the system is still didn't create any model here. So there are no model created. There are no detrending. The detrending starts in this point because now the system has uh, enough information in order to create this detrending stuff that we have. So in this case, we have uh, um, the value of this analysis of this particular field. What we can do is we can move on the bottom, the last things that we are going to do because we are going to run out of time and we can perform a forecast. Now, as I mean, if you don't have so much data, the forecast is totally useless. But if you have a lot of data, the, the forest and forecast can be very interesting. Let me try. The system say, okay, how do you want to predict? One day, two days, three weeks, and so on. Let me say that I want to predict 15 days. So in order to uh, try to guess what's happening in the next 15 days, according to the pattern before, so I can run the job and the system give me back a visualization like this one. Okay, it's not beautiful at the moment, but the system say, look, in the future, in the next week, the 8th of March and so on, 
uh, the data are not correct, by the way. So we are going to be low with a minimum and a maximum of 825, for example, and the minimum 300 with a prediction of 563. This is my prediction of the price on the March 11. And then we try to go a little bit up and then we go down again and then we go up. As you can see, the system spot the pattern. So that means the previous pattern basically follow this line, this draw over here. And you see in prediction as well. So this is a very good pattern. You almost never have so beautiful pattern in a real data, by the way. And uh, yeah, that's basically um, what you have over here. So, and then you have your job, uh, the name of the job. And okay, sorry, this is a regression. Um, anomaly detection. You have your job over here that we created, test meetup. You have all the information that you need about the job. So if you want to see the configuration, the job configuration, the data feed, the data feed is the query that you are going to use in order to pick up the data. As you can see by default, we use a match all. You can change as you like. So in most of the cases, you should change by the way. And then you have the number of the document, the JSON that we created in order to configure the job and uh, everything, the, the, the forecast part, everything that you are doing is right down immediately in, uh, in, in the JSON configuration. So that's what we have and so on. So basically this is how you configure your anomaly detection. Let me stop here. Sorry, I don't have so much time for, um, um, for watch the other part that is basically, let me turn on the light, that is basically the supervised machine learning, but I'm here for any question that you need. Awesome, thank you. Can you see the chat function, by the way, with the questions? Yeah, I can see something. Uh, I cannot see before. Question later, how much neural network processing built? Uh, okay, so, uh, well, in this case, uh, uh, we don't do it because uh, we don't we don't have any algorithm for uh, natural language processing at the moment. But you can use uh, the experimental part about classification that it doesn't do basically the same job, but in the future will do. So at the moment is still ongoing. Um, what about the license? Besides, it's not open source. No, it's not open source. You have 30 days trial. And then I have no idea how much it costs because that's a commercial stuff, but it, I, it's a premium license. So you need, uh, you don't, we have three level of license. We have the standard, we have the basic license that you can use. Then we have the gold and we have the premium. So the premium is the one that includes the machine learning. So that's basically how does it work? Uh, ah, I see that you already set everything. I have a cluster of three nodes. Uh, with platinum license, this question might be a little bit general, but how can you determine how many machine learning jobs you can? Well, it depends on the memory. Run before impact. Uh, okay, uh, you should uh, you should test. Uh, let me explain how does it work. Uh, machine learning is not Java. It's a C plus plus functionality. What's happened here? If you set up a node with a machine learning that is machine learning node. Uh, you have to set up the memory like normal node. So basically you have your JVM option file in the configuration directory. You're going to set up, for example, 20 gigabytes, okay? Uh, the system use uh, those kind of memory, a small part use for Elastic itself because it's still Elastic, it's still the part of the Java. All the rest of the memory on the heap uh, that is uh, remaining, it's completely dedicated to the machine learning system. So in order to understand how to do this one, you have to run a job, it depends how many data you have. For example, my customer this morning, they have uh, uh, eight years of data and it takes a lot. They need uh, three, four nodes uh, for machine learning for how many jobs they have. So you have to test a little bit. Uh, and uh, you should also set up the machine learning node in a server that has a little bit of power of calculus. So a processor and everything. Uh, it's always depend. So it's, uh, it depends. That's what we say in, uh, in Elastic, we have to try. 
Um, usually, remember also another stuff uh, that every single job that you set up will be performing in a single node. Okay, so the system is very is very good to distribute the job all over the node that you have for machine learning. But if you have a single node and you have twenty jobs, those twenty jobs they are going to run in the single node. If you have three, the twenty job will be split over the three node according to memory as well. Because uh, if you set up that you want a maximum of one gigabyte of memory for a particular process, the system will select the server that has free one particular megabyte. So it's basically uh, automatically scaled, this kind of stuff. But one job is not split over different processor. It's split just in the same node. That's is something that you have to, to, to consider. And uh, for all the rest, uh, um, we have to see. We have to see how many jobs you have, how many data you have, uh, how many memory you have, how many processor, and so on. It always depends. Other, did I jump some other question? Yes, Tristano, you have 30 days trial for using. Hey, Hemin, how are you? <laughs> uh, will this presentation also be published? I think so. That's not me that decides. Yeah. We're okay. recording now, so we'll be on our YouTube channel. And if you will share the, share the slides, I will also share with the audience. Absolutely, absolutely. I will send you the PDF of the slide, yes. Um, good, okay. since there are no other questions. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much, Luca. Great thank as you always. Much. Um, and thanks everyone who joined. We'll publish the recording tomorrow or uh, Monday, but probably tomorrow. And uh, yeah, hope to see you soon at our meetups again. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.